Father, I don't know, you've been up to some good things this morning by the Spirit of God. Touching some people and and me in particular. God, I thank you for whatever you were doing today. So this time we have, would you just uh, quicken me and cause my tongue to be, as it were, by the pen of the ready writer, that by the Spirit of God to inscribe upon the hearts of those that are here things that are pertinent for right now in their life and for the days ahead, we pray. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, man, I love the Lord. I love when God shows up Amen. and does something kind of a little bit off the cue. I've said to you before, we're always praying for signs and wonders, but just don't show up in such a way that it makes us really wonder, okay? <laughs> we just would all be heading for the back door. I've been to some services where I've seen God do some stuff that I'm telling you, I was looking for the back door. It was outside of my ball game, but it was God and the miracles. I was at a service one time, and uh, and uh, a guy named Casey Treat is a friend of mine. And Casey now has built a church over near Federal Way, Washington. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't relate to the geographical area. And uh, so Benny Hinn uh, had come to town. This is before Benny got big, big, big. And uh, something didn't work out at the auditorium, and so uh, Casey said, you can use my church. And Casey at that time, he seated probably a couple thousand, maybe a little over, probably a little over. And uh, so I went up for the meetings. Now, you know, whatever you want to say about Benny Hinn, I'm not just standing by him doctrinally on anything or whatever. I just know that Benny Hinn has miracles in his services, and that's that. So how do you know that? Well, because I was uh, on the second row back. I'm a, I'm a front row setter. When I go to some place, Tony, I want to be on that front row. I mean, when the fire comes out, I want to be there when it's flash hot, okay? And uh, there was this guy from Alaska. And he had this arm all, I don't know what happened to him, but it was twisted. I mean, I don't know how to describe it. And it was like that. And he, he could turn his hand like that, but his arm went that way. I, I don't know how to explain it. And Benny's up there, and we're, it's during worship. I don't think Benny ever even preached on anything that day. He's just sharing. And I saw with my own eyes, I looked back, I don't know why I happened to look back, I saw that arm go ziggy-wiggy, however you want to do it, and turn normal. I saw it. I saw it. And the guy went up on the platform, and he said, any miracles here? And he went up on the platform, and I saw it, and I couldn't believe it. You ever see something you can't believe? It happened. And so the guy went up and he shared about, hey, I came down here. Well, if you hadn't have seen it, you wouldn't have believed it. But I saw it before it happened. It just caught my attention. It was so weird the way his arm was. And the guy's up there blubbering like a baby. You would too. You would too. Benny didn't heal him. Benny can't heal. Peter could not heal a sick flea. Hello? The apostle Peter could not heal a sick flea. He said it's this name. It's this name Jesus that has healed this person. It's this name Jesus that set this person free. It's this name Jesus that did this. Everything happens through the power and the anointing and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. We just happen to show up at a certain time and God uses us as an instrument, but it wasn't about us. But yet it was about you because you needed to have... God uses people to get things done. God uses people 
to get things done. So like this morning, if I hadn't obeyed God and laid hands on people, well, they wouldn't have got it. But when I obeyed, it wasn't me. I just obeyed God. Amen. Boom. I don't know what he was doing. But boom, he was touching some people here this morning. There's no doubt about that. And I thank God for uh, men who heard the Holy Ghost and <coughs> called me out of a crowd and said, I, I got to lay hands on you. Boom. Called me up. Thank God they obeyed God. Laid hands on me. And uh, there was an impartation and an anointing of the Holy Ghost. Boom. Thank God for that. So God uses us, but it's not about us. And that's where we have to be careful. And not to touch the glory. You know, if there's one thing I do, always do, after every service, wherever I've been, is I get on my knees and I said, now, Lord, I know they meant well. They came to me and they said, Brother Buell, that was an awesome sermon, this, that, whatever. You know, I know they meant well. They're trying to convey it to God, but I'm the only one they can touch, so they come to me, okay? But before I go to bed, I kneel down. And I say, God, I will not touch your glory. I know what it's all about. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. Years ago, I was uh, getting ready to preach. and, and, and uh, You know how God can ask you a question, and then he'll answer it at the same time? Anybody ever had God ask you a question, and, and the answer is right there? Because you would have answered wrong if he hadn't gave you the answer. You, you've been there. And so I'm praying. I said, now, Lord, we're going we're gonna to be here in this service here. And it was a good-sized church. And, uh, you know, I'm praying about that. You know, God, we just, you know. And the uh, Lord said, uh, why are you praying that prayer? I said, um, so I'll look good. Because I don't want to look bad. You know? <laughs> I said, because I want to look good. He said, yeah. He said, you should be praying that my glory will be revealed, not that you look good. Ouch. I mean, I'm getting ready to preach, and he's talking to me that way. God God just shouldn't be allowed to do that. But I realized in the vanity of my own heart, I thought I was praying right. But the reality of it is I I didn't want to look bad. And that set me free. So if I look bad... Take that to God, okay? Because I'm off the hook. <laughs> now you study it and prepare to be a, you know, to show yourself approved and all that. I got that. But bottom line, if it doesn't reveal the glory of God, Amen. if something isn't isn't in it that touches people, then it's vain. So that's always the cry of my heart. Now I'm going to be a little bit rough on you this week, but next week I've got a great message. God gave me the sermon title, When Death Died. Now, he's not giving me the sermon yet, so I don't know, the sermon might stink, but I really like the title. <laughs> it's an awesome title, The Day Death Died. And I'm putting that together in my mind. I mean, he just spoke so clear to me, preach on The Day Death Died. Well, man, I, I've, been, I've been tracking that down. Alan, I need to call you to get some help, Bible help there. But... Uh, and I had something today, too, but we'll just kick it off for a few minutes. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Wait, 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 wait let me read that again. I, that must be a misquote. Moses, the man who's going to upset the Egyptian empire, the man who's going to part the Red Sea, the man who's going to lead a million and a half, at least a million and a half people into the wilderness, the man that's going to establish the church, the, the church in the wilderness, a prototype of us today, a prophet of God, was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. This man is shoveling sheep dung for somebody else. 
Boy, there's a lot to learn right there. Come on. The priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert. Desert. Dry. Barren. Anybody ever been there? And came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw, now listen, when the Lord saw that he turned aside. See, the call didn't come when he saw the bush burning. Bush was burning. He walked right by it, but he stopped. And he kept looking back. He said, hmm, when the Lord saw. Then God called to him from the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Wow. Wow. Romans 8. And we know that all things Work together for good to those who love God. Do you love God? And those who are are called, if you love God, there's a call on you. According to his purpose. And that purpose will vary between every one of us. But all things work together for good to those who love God. And who are called according to his purpose. I was in prayer uh, this week. I usually try to pray one day a week. And uh, that particular day I was praying, the Lord visited me in the night or in the morning, I don't know. Like Paul said, I don't know if I was in the body, out of the body, wherever I was. But anyway, it's like I had a uh, vision over uh, the church. And... I just saw aspects of all the different lives that are here. And uh, the Lord clearly spoke to me, and I don't know, he didn't give me a, I wish he'd just give me an outline of three points in a poem. But he just spoke to me and he said, um, nothing, nothing that you've been through is wasted. But let me say that again. Nothing that you have been through shall be wasted. Now, we wonder about that. We're perplexed about things that come and go in our life. And how can this work for good? But the Bible says all things work together for good. And the Bible says everything that the devil brings against us for harm, God turns around for good. So, Moses. Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Did you ever think about humanity in the Bible? You know, when you read it, we always try to look at all the spiritual side of it. But how about the humanity side of it? Now, here's Moses. Moses. 
He's one who's drawn out. Remember? They, they had the edict to kill all the first male children. And his mother put him in the, a type of an ark. Put him in the Nile River. And Pharaoh's daughter found him. And Moses means drawn out. He was drawn out. And he's raised. In, uh, as my mother would say, in the lap of luxury. I mean, if he wanted a grape, he just opened his mouth and somebody would put a grape right there in his mouth. You know? <laughs> and big old fans, you know, just fanning around. And somebody, I mean, you have to worry about underwear. I mean, somebody had fresh pressed undies every morning for him. It was good. And yet it wasn't good either. Because nobody ever blinked when they saw him walk through the palace. He belonged there. But he didn't belong there either, did he? I mean, he, 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 nobody would question why he was there or, or how he got there. No question, but it didn't fit. Do you ever, you ever feel like you didn't fit? Hello? So there he is in a place that he doesn't fit. Now he's a Hebrew living with the Egyptians. But he can't go over here and hang out with the brothers, the Hebrews, because he smells like an Egyptian. And on top of that, God forbid, but he has an Egyptian accent. Huh? Do you ever, you ever, in a situation where you kind of tried to watch your mouth because it would give away uh, your position? Come on. You know, I've, I've been in those places. Finally, I just thought, I don't care. You just love me as I am, I don't care. But you ever been in a place where you're trying to, you know, you wanna, you're trying to find the King's English that you should have learned when you were in high school? But you didn't, and now you're in a position, come on. So we can't hang out with him. Because he smells like an Egyptian, and he talks like an Egyptian. Well, what's the guy going to do? What are you going to do? So now, there's a call on his life, but every call starts out as a seed. He was a leader because he was a leader, but he wasn't a leader there. It was just a seed, but he became what he was, the seed. God calls you to do something. He calls things that are not as though they are, but it starts out as a seed form in your life. And as you obey God along, listen, if you curse the way God has led you, you'll never get to where he's trying to lead you. Oh, let me just back right up and say that again. If you curse the way you think God has led you, and you've been wronged, you'll never get to where God is trying to lead you. Hello? Where's that? I just, just lost my whole train of thought, if I had a thought anyway. So Moses knows the stirring is in him, and he rises up, and he kills an Egyptian. Remember the story? He kills the Egyptian. Well, now his brethren won't let him forget that. Oh, they're going to remind him of it all the time. Now listen. People will not forget what you've done. That's why be careful what you do. Be careful what you do when you're young. So his brethren didn't didn't let him forget it, so he finally had to flee. He had to run out away from Pharaoh. His life was in jeopardy. So he gets out in the wilderness. And uh, he's, he's away from Pharaoh. It's all good. And so he's out there in the wilderness, and he's doing the happy, happy victory dance. That, this is the way they danced back in those days. And uh, out there in the desert, uh, it's just a happy dance going on. And then, all of a sudden, he thought... Wait, I've got to eat. 
I'm away from Pharaoh. Happy dance, but I've got to eat. Which plant do you eat that kills you, and which plant do you eat? See, he never went to survival training school in Pharaoh's court. He's out there in the wilderness. Have you ever been in a place where you're over here and you're doing the happy dance because God did something? And over here, well, let's see. On April the 15th, I've got this issue, this issue coming up. Hello, anybody? So he's out here doing a happy dance, and now he's got issues. So it was bad. We look at it, Pharaoh's court, all was good. No, it wasn't all good. It wasn't all good. Has everything been all good in your life? One liar here will cast the devil out of him before we leave today. But it wasn't, it wasn't all good. Now, it wasn't bad, bad as we look at it, but for Moses, it was, it was complicated. Now, don't be crying about bad. Because your bad can go from bad to worse. Hello? So now he's out here in this wilderness, bad to worse. Now it's crisis. It's crisis time. Well, what's he, what's he going to eat? And there's snakes out there too. Complicated. Moses' life was complicated. Moses' life was complicated until he was 80 years old before he finally got it right. Somebody ought to say, well, thank God there's hope for me. <laughs> but, but it's true. Complicated. I want to talk to somebody today about complicated. Listen. I have an awesome testimony. My, my, my mother and father were wonderful, God-fearing people. And, but not all of my testimony is fit for human consumption because it's complicated. Now, overall, overall, it's good. And when I lay myself beside stories I hear of people, and especially in this day that we live in, that is so heartbreaking, mine is awesome, but yet it's complicated. So, those of you who are just beginning this journey in the Lord, let me just tell you something. Everybody here has something complicated in their life. Hello? You know, uh, uh, we uh, have somebody, they stand up and they share, you know, about, uh, they've been married 50 years or 60 years, and we clap, and well, we should. I mean, hey, hello, that's an honor. But when they stand up and they say, we have been, we have been happily married, for 50 years, they're lying. <laughs> they're, they're, they're lying. They're lying. I, I've lived long enough to know. Hey, nobody is happy every moment, every minute, every week, or every month happy your whole life. Give me a break. And that's just you living alone, let alone living with somebody. So if you're just starting out on this path of following Jesus Christ, don't look at some Norman Rockwell painting and think that's life. It is not, it's not life. I mean, I love that Thanksgiving you know, picture, and we probably would have had it that nice, but some cousin had to show up somewhere, you know, and be there with us. Uh, but we got, hey, isn't that your cousin over there? Uh, no, 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 that's not my cousin. We, we all have stuff. Now, overall, life is good. 
over all 60 years of marriage, God bless you, and you loved each other more than, than when you first got married, and you thought you were in love when you got married, and 60 years into it, there's a different kind of love, right? Got it. But in between, come on, folks. So Moses was going through all this. He was a man. He didn't fit in. He, he was too a Hebrew to be an Egyptian. He was too Egyptian to be a Hebrew. And there he was. Now he's out in the backside of the desert, stumbling around, and fortunately, by the grace of God, he bumps into this man called Jethro, Midianite. And he takes him in, and he said, hey, don't eat that plant, that'll kill you. <clears throat> and don't eat that snake, in fact, don't eat any snakes, just leave them alone. And this water's bitter, and that water's sweet, and he learned the ropes. But he didn't fit in there either. Now, if he had of, he'd have built a house out in the desert. Probably a nice house. Up on, you know, overlooking something. But he didn't fit in there either. That's the second word God gave me. Is for some of you, uh, you felt like a misfit. You didn't fit in here. You did for a while. You were a blessing while you were there, but you didn't fit in here. And you were a blessing while you were there, but you just, you, you, you just, you've been a misfit. You haven't found your fit. Can I, can I say that that can be God? Yeah. That can be God? Yeah. You know, the eagle, uh, we went out to cut wood. Alan pointed this out to me so clearly. So if I'm wrong, you talk to Alan after the service. But, uh, you know, the eagle does get the nest all built up and fluffy and all that. <clears throat> and then she starts stirring up the nest. You know, the Bible says that as the eagle stirs up the nest, so God will stir up your nest. Not every uncomfortable thing that comes along is a satanic attack. Oh, wait a minute here. Back off. Not everything that comes along that stirs up your nest is a satanic attack. We can get so comfortable in something, if God doesn't come along and start pulling up some stuff and cause us to sit on a little thorn, we'll just stay right there and he doesn't want you to stay there. Sometimes we're wondering, well, where, where is God at? Well, he's over here waiting for you. He's waiting for you. And me. So she starts stirring up the nest and the little eaglet's in there and he tries to sit here and ooh, ooh. So he comes over here and he says, he goes, ooh, what's happened to my little nest here? And he goes over here and he says, and ooh, ooh, it kind of thorny. So can you imagine those little eagles? Mama always shows up at a certain time with the meat or whatever, all the time. And now she's running a little behind because she knows what she's doing. Mama should have been here by now. I know what the problem is. Devil, I rebuke you in all the powers of hell in Jesus' name. Hold up my blessing from coming to me. And in Jesus' name, I command, I command that meat to come. And, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's kind of like us sometimes. Hey! Might be God stirring up your nest. Hello? I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus' name. Well, there's a place for that. I believe in that. But there's also a place to be still and know that I'm God. And there's a place to having done all just to simply stand. You know, we get in such a hurry. We, we, you know, we got all this just... Lockdown. We got our formula. Well, I don't care. This happens, I'm going to quote this. And this happens, I'm going to quote that. And trust me, I believe in quoting the Bible. I believe that's the only weapon you have is the word right here. I believe that. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes we just need to. Yeah, yeah. Have you noticed how life has a way of hitting your mute button? Mute, M U T E. I got one on TV, hit the mute button. Life has a way of hitting your mute button. Uh, we'll call it 
shut your mouth. <laughs> you ever notice that? I mean, I tell you, it was a time I knew more about raising children than anybody in the world. And then I had a few. You, you hear what I'm talking about? Life has a way of our, our ideal, I, we got these ideas, ideology. Then when you get into the real world, you find out that maybe the principle might work, but the, all of your ideology will not quite fit into the shoe. And life has a way to hit your mute button. Moses went through all of this stuff. And he didn't fit in there, he didn't fit in here, and he, and he, he became completely aware of his weaknesses. You know, when you become aware of your weaknesses, that's when God can exalt you. Because you know it, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, and he can exalt you, and then you don't forget from whence you came. Let me say this. He was out there in the backside of the desert tending his father-in-law's sheep. Weren't even his sheep. And the Bible says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. How many people have missed the opportunity because they, they were looking for some great thing to happen right now? Doesn't start that way. Life doesn't work that way. It's a day of small beginnings for this. And I don't care. This, this will work here, but this will not work for that. You know what I mean? So when God transitions you and you've got this down and everybody applauds you here, but you get over here, sometimes that does not always work for this. You gotta you gotta learn again, you gotta go back to school. And and that's what God God is trying to take us from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And it's a learning process all the way. Moses had to go through this whole thing. Over and over and over and over and over. God does not waste anything. I said earlier, if my mom served something that I didn't like, it's better to eat it while it's hot, because you're going to get it again. I mean, one way or another, my mom's going to have that back on the table, and nothing's going to be wasted. Okay? So there's some stuff that comes along. I don't like it, but God will work it for good. I have to have faith in God. He's going to work it for good. I can't see the end from the beginning. Only God can. But I have to have faith in God. That he's going to, he's going to work it all out. And he will. So he's out there in, this, in the desert. Jethro takes him in. And then Jethro says, uh, well, I've got some work for you to do. Work? Work. I mean, I hate to mention a four-letter word in church, but work is kind of in the Bible. Work. We hired people to work. I don't work. I got jewelry I can't wear and too many clothes to put on. And Well, you're, that was there. That was when you were in the palace. Now you're in the wilderness and there's work to be done. So he's out there leading these sheep. Now, he was a leader in seed, and the fruit, the first fruit of him being a leader was, was sheep. You ever see those pictures of uh, sheep, you know, all, you know, beautiful white sheep? Trust me, those pictures are photo enhanced. <laughs> you ever been around real sheep? <laughs> They're stinky. <laughs> and so he's out there leading, leading them around, and and he's learning how to kill snakes, and he's learning how to do this. And he's learning. How, listen, you can't take somebody where you've never been. You cannot take somebody where you've never been. Why the Bible says, "Don't prophesy beyond your faith." You know what? What does that mean? That means if some guy calls you out and prophesies about you, you're going to go see the whole world, and he hasn't even been out of Klamath County. Give me a break. Give me a break. I mean, I've had guys prophesy over me, but they've been around the world. 
It was in the encompass of their faith. They'd been there. And they prophesied, you do this, you do that, and by the grace of God, I did. But you can't be prophesying to somebody you're going to go around the world and you haven't even left the city limits of Klamath Falls. That's beyond your faith. So, where was I at? Lost my train of thought again. <laughs> God, Lord, help me. You cannot take somebody where you've never been. So, when he comes back and he says to Pharaoh, I am that I am has sent me, let my people go. Let my people go. So, he said, well, let's get the magicians together. And they threw down their rods and they turned into snakes. Moses threw his rod down and it turned into a snake and just tore up all them other snakes. Well, now, that had been way over his head if he hadn't been in the wilderness. That had been way over his head if he hadn't been in the wilderness. Oh, stuck his hand in there. He said, what? then what's this? Leprosy. What's this? Clean. Where did you learn that? <laughs> he learned that the same place you have learned what you've learned. He went to the University of the School of Survival, and he minored in miracles. All of you here have majored in the University of Survival. And you've minored in miracles. You had them, oh, miracles have showed up, of course, or we wouldn't be here without miracles. But we didn't live on miracles. We lived on survival. I don't know how old I was before I realized we were poor. I mean, we had food on the table, and, and of course, potatoes, and Tule Lake grew up. I mean, I was, I was trying to think the other day, what meal did I ever have growing up that there wasn't a potato of some kind on that plate? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, potato, potato, I mean, potatoes. And I didn't realize we were poor. Because we had, I mean, compared to the world, we were rich, but I mean, as far as, you know, cultural things, we, we wouldn't have any money. We had food, but we didn't have any money. I didn't realize we were poor. I remember we'd go someplace and park, and Dad would say, stay in the car. And out there in that hot car, you know, my folks would be in jail today. <laughs> huh? Come on, how many of you have been stuck in a car while the folks said, you stay in the car, we'll be out here in a minute and two hours later. Come on, out there sweating. But see, they didn't worry about it, because uh, if you're poor, hot cannot kill poor folks. Hot only kills rich people. I mean, you just fan harder. And so when life gets tough, you just learn to fan harder. Come on. So Moses got stuck out there on the backside of the desert, and he didn't have anybody running them fans for him. He had to learn to fan. And God will allow you to go through some stuff to learn how to fan. He'll allow you to go through stuff to toughen you up. He'll allow you to go through stuff so you've got something to pass on to somebody behind you. So when Moses stands up to Pharaoh, he knew he was the only one that could have done that. He knew the, the English, not English, but the Pharaohism, Egyptianism. He knew how to speak the language. He knew who to bow to, who to defer to, who to do this to. He knew all the ins and outs of that court thing. He knew how to, hey, don't you think he didn't have to do some political maneuvering? Come on. And he knew, he's the only guy that knew how to get it before he stood before Pharaoh and said, I am that I am. You just didn't walk up there and walk up to Pharaoh's face. Come on, it took some time for him to finally get before Pharaoh. He said, I am that I am has sent me. He was the only guy that could have done it. He was trained for that. But on the other hand of that, he had been working like a dog out there in the backside of the desert taking care of Jethro's sheep. So now he could relate to the Hebrew children who were trying to make as many bricks as Pharaoh wanted without straw. He could relate to that too. 
So when he led them out into the wilderness, he had been there. He had been there. Listen, you've been through some wilderness. It's because you've been there. God has a purpose out of it. Nothing is going to waste out of your life. And not only will you may not see it in this life, but he's putting things together for the next life too, that he's working all things according to the goodness of his goodness towards you in what you what will be in the next life too. You would not be what you are without what you've gone through. You, 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 come on. You would not be what you are without having gone what you've gone through. Did God send every bit of it? No. No, no. But God still can cause all things to work together for good. That's God. We just have faith in God. So now he can relate to this, and he can relate to them, because he's worked like a dog, and now he can take them out into the wilderness, and they said, he said, well, better wrap it up. Wrap up. It's going to get cold tonight. Wrap up. How do you know? I've been there. I've been there. Moses, my child's been bitten by a snake. Hey, I'll take care of it. How do you know? I've been there. I've been there. You know, people, oh, stay away from that water. That water is bitter water. How do you know? I've been there. I've been there. People come to you, maybe it's your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, not even relatives, but they come to you. Well, how do you know that, Reuben? Oh, I've been there. I've been there. And you know how I learned it? Because I made a real dumb mistake when I was there, and now I know. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> okay. But I've been there. Uh, I talked to my son. I talked to my sons, you know. And I said, "Now listen, boys. Oh, did I tell you that I got the two boys preaching one in Hawaii this morning? The Assembly of God Church and Joe is. Well, he's probably about done now. He probably he preaches quicker than me. He's probably done. And uh, listen, I'm going to let you out of here before Sizzler's closes today. I promise you that. Okay. But uh, <clears throat> so I told them. This, this, this looks pretty simple, but there's more to it than meets the eye. Preaching, pastoring, there's more to it than meets the eye. And you don't learn this just uh, by going to Bible school. You learn, you learn a whole lot more uh, in life, uh, the life of hard knocks, university, whatever it is. You know, let me, can I just tell you something here before I let you go? about following the will of God. Now see, Moses was, he was pushed out and the nest gets disrupted and we have to go. But you know one of the ways that you can follow the leading of God is when the grace of God is lifted. See, when the grace of God is on you, you don't feel the weight of it. I mean, you look back when you did two or three jobs and you were raising a kid and you were doing that and all that. How'd you do that? The grace of God. Could you do that today? Ain't no way. But it was the grace of God. And you didn't feel the weight of that because of the grace of God. So when God begins to lift the grace, I begin to realize that I don't, there's no longer oil. You know, oil keeps all the machinery running smooth. It's kind of like you start letting the oil slip out and things start to grind. That's a sign. And and then it starts grinding. And God God will lead that way too. When I was out of the army I went to uh went back to the University of Idaho and uh, man, I just nothing was working, I'm telling you. Tony, I'd read the same paragraph nineteen times and couldn't get it. And I always thought I had a half a light bulb on all the time. And uh, I just thought, I'm not getting it. There was, no, there was no grace. So I checked out of the school. I said, it, it, this is not working. I didn't understand it. And uh, so my next job, uh, from there, you had, you had work, W-O-R-K, work. So I had to work. 
and I got a job with the Burger and Plate. They were owned by a company in England, and they did peas and littles. Now, let me tell you what my job was. I lifted 100-pound sacks of peas and lentils all day long, put them in boxcars or put them on pallets to put them in semi-trucks. Sewed those things, and then, like an idiot, I took the job of an assistant foreman or something, 10 cents more an hour, and this great big plant, I had to run up three stories to check the shakers that were cleaning the peas or the lentils. So 10 cents more an hour, how many times a day I had to run up there because they were still bagging them down there while I was up there. I'd, I'd, run, it, I'd run it back down, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm in the wilderness. I'm lifting these sacks. This is a no-brainer. I mean, you don't have to. If you can't learn that job, you're, you're dumb. Pick up a sack, drop it. Up, I mean, that's a hard, it was work. But then, when God put his hand on me, and I went to Christ for the Nations, I had a GI Bill that I would have wasted at the University of Idaho. God's grace wasn't on me to be at the University of Idaho. Great college, but God's grace wasn't on me to be there. A few years later, God had saved that money for me, so my GI Bill was used when I went to Bible college. And we go through stuff in life and we're frustrated and we're thinking, I don't have sense God's grace here, I don't this. Well, if God's grace isn't there, you know, if the, if the bread starts coming, uh, maybe you ought to go find another place to get a meal. Not everything that happens is because it's a satanic attack. As many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So we have to learn how to be led by the Spirit of God in different things. It's not always easy. I mean, I still scratch my head. That's why I don't have any hair left. I scratch my head so often trying to figure out God. Go with it. I'm going to close with this. I had a word that just set me free. And I've known this all along, but sometimes, you ever have God tell you something that you know, and then you heard it again for the first time? You ever had that happen? And, uh, Ryan asked me a question about, uh, about this church. He said, uh, what, what are your plans? I can't remember how he ordered it. It was a great question. I love that. I love questions like that. And I thought, well, and then he said, is it just to keep the church doors open? I thought, well, I think it's more than that. But, you know, what well, I didn't have, and I didn't, I still don't have the answer. But God spoke to me the other night. He who abides in the shadow of the Almighty. That's all he said. He who abides in the shadow of the Almighty. So when God's moving, he has a shadow. Like I have a shadow up here. Get in the right place. You just, I just stay in the shadow. If he runs, then we run. If he stops, we stop. If he moves backwards, we go backwards. That's all I can do. Is try to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And it'll all work out. Because I'm not God. I know I, look, I know I look a lot like him, but I'm not God, honest. It's me. It's really me. My dad came home, and, and this is many, many years ago. I have a sister that's 20 years younger than I am. And she had this little friend. They're still friends to this day, Joe. And uh, he's a... Uh, something with uh, Washington State University now. God blessed him. Anyway, they were all dressed up and had on these little dresses and everything. And so Dad came home for lunch. And Joe, he's in this little girl's dress and everything. He said, oh, Lorie, you have a little girlfriend. That nice. What's your name? And Joe said, Mr. Buell, it's me, Joe. Honest, it's me. Honest, it's me. He's, Honest, it's me. It's me, it's me. God knows who you are. He's not bothered by every problem we bring to him. And some of this we have to walk out day by day. That's just the way it's going to have to be. But nothing that is 
come through your life is going to be wasted. Nothing is going to be wasted. God works it all together, all of it, all together for good. Every tear you cried, every heartache you felt, every abandonment you've been through, everything. No, God didn't send it, but God causes it to work together for good. Life. Stuff happens in life. Bottom line, have faith in God. That's all I can tell you. Have faith in God. So some of you that are just beginning this journey, listen, if you will just have faith in God, in the long run, it will all work out for you. In the long run, it will all work out for your good. Nothing.